what we're hoping to be able to gain from this panel discussion is to elaborate on what some of those challenges are, to understand what are some new and emerging ways of thinking about leadership in both the private and the public sector, looking for connections and also differences where those exist, examples of best practices in thinking about leadership and developing leadership both in the private and public sector. And I think we have an all-star panel to be able to address this question. Just a couple of observations that, have, that, that, that I have seen, um, have admired, and other leaders have tried to emulate myself. Again, I'm sure you've heard all of these today, but, but one is having a sense of the mission and sense of the vision. Again, these cut across public-private. I'm going to speak a little bit uh, toward the end about uh, public sector specific characteristics. Um, but y y you want to understand the mission, you want to have a vision for direction, and then you sort of want to exude excitement um, and generate uh, energy so that the people around you um, have a sense of that direction and, 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 and that, that vision. Uh, the people around you, the smartest thing you can do is surround yourself with people who are smarter than you are and listen to them. Mm -hmm. Allow your folks and yourself to take risks. So point three is take risks. Um, men, by the way, are much better at that than women. This is one of my you know, sort of footnote for the women. Don't wait until you're ready for the job. The guys mm -hmm. don't wait until they're ready for the job. <laughs> um, just go at it. And I learned that, I learned that mm -hmm. when I headed up the US and Foreign Commercial Service. Mm -hmm. I did not want the job. I knew it was a management job, 200 some odd. Um, uh, field offices, uh, 1,300 employees, all different nationalities, all over the world. They needed a manager. They didn't need a policy wonk. Um, and the late Bob Mossbacker said, nope, you need to do this job, and I will let you hire a deputy who knows something about management. And that's exactly what he did, and I brought in a guy who was so much smarter than I will ever be about ma management. And between the two of us, uh, we did a pretty good, did, did a pretty good job. Um, Leave the place better than it was when you walked in. And the place, when you're a political appointee, you move in, in and out of an organization. A career person, you'll move in and out of an organization. Private sector, same kind of thing. Uh, people will remember and respect the fact that you left uh, the organization in better shape. I have always found uh, that leading by example to reduce turfiness uh, makes everyone look better and you accomplish a lot more. Some organizations that's harder than others, uh, but I have yet to see one where it isn't a recipe for success. Um, and you may not have control over any of the things I just described. You do have control, no matter where you are, over two things. One is your personal integrity and the other is showing respect to the people you work with, to the people who work for you, and to the people you work for. Um, and you can never go wrong as a leader with both of those. Even though we've got data mining and all these fancy SAP and stuff like that where, where leaders can have dashboards and windshields to look at what's going on, one of the great dangers is that many leaders, when they're confronted with this amount of complexity, start to change their own frame of reference. They start to shrink their perspectives and what I call it selective perception. They only look at certain things. They become narrower in focus but deeper in focus, which is a danger at the enterprise level. At the same time, and this is again a problem when you have 400 uh, channels and people go on the internet to thousands of sites, peripheral knowledge disappears. The ability to have full situational awareness. We heard this morning about innovation creativity. Some of that comes from understanding that there are things that may be happening halfway around the world or in a totally different industry that may address your issues. But if you're not looking at those websites, if you're not watching those TV shows, if you're not talking to those people or going to those conferences, you don't know it. And so a, a modern day leader has to take an added effort to reach out and to break across those lines to stretch their peripheral knowledge so that something that if they're in the hospitality industry, this might be something happening in the IT industry. If they're in the medical industry, it may be happening in the cosmetic industry, whatever. The key is you have to stretch across it and, and that's a lot more of a burden to be proactive. I think leadership has always been critical. But I think things have emerged over the last 10 years that have made it even more challenging. T 
Today, it's not unusual for the relationship between a leader and his or her team to be virtual. We have 392 offices in 43 states, and we're also international. I also think that doing business globally today often means that you're hiring from that location rather than relying on expats from your organization. Both of these make it even more essential in my mind that leaders focus on strategic and cultural alignment as a way to drive performance. I think this requires a different leadership style than what I was training leaders on back in 1981, so I've really dated myself. <laughs> then we used to talk about leadership as a system that was composed of four functions, planning, organizing, leading, and controlling, and all the activities that go in back of each of those. Yesterday, I just finished doing a strategic alignment workshop with my CEO and his direct reports and the top executives of our company, where we were discussing the role of leaders as being architects of the strategy, translators of the strategy, and those who have to execute the strategy. I'll tell you a story. Not long after I joined Martin Marietta, and that was before it merged with Lockheed, we received a hostile takeover bid from Bendix, which was then led by Bill Agee. We had just announced a new CEO, Tom Ponell, who was still in a transition period. Everybody in the company, especially headquarters where I worked, was worried, anxious, and scared. And Tom really came forward as a true leader. He pulled everyone together. He told us the situation. He outlined the broad aspects of the plan, his commitment to keep us informed, which he did on a regular basis, and his expectation that we continue to perform at the highest level for our customers and the company. So he made it very clear what our role was. He ended that initial meeting by vowing to fly a flag at the headquarters until our counteroffensive was over. And that was the don't tread on me flag. To remind myself how crucial a role leadership plays in organizations, I often think of Peter Drucker's simple yet profound adage that leaders should always think of their employees as volunteers. Now his point was that the difference between what mo most employees need to do to keep their jobs or even be extremely successful represents a small fraction of what they could really do if they were fully engaged in their work, right? In other words, full engagement always involves people volunteering, uh, going the extra mile, putting their heart and soul into their work because they choose to, not because they have to. And that's, of course, where leadership comes into play. A strong leader can inspire and motivate their staffs to, to volunteer far better than any other management tool I've seen or used. Better than pay, better than punishment, uh, for sure, at least in my experience. Uh, no, today I would argue that intangible assets appear to be increasingly important in determining the winners and losers. Assets like corporate culture, reputations, intellectual capital, performance ethics, and, and so on. And at the heart of these advantage lie fully engaged people, right? Not tariff barriers, not privileged access to government decision makers, not control over a key raw material, but fully engaged people. And as Drucker taught us, that requires leadership. So the move toward intangible assets is an increasingly important driver of competitive advantage is one reason I believe that leadership is more important than ever. Another related reason I think it is more important than ever is that our private and public sector organizations are becoming increasingly complex, and thus the challenges of, of alignment, strategic uh, alignment that we talked about earlier, are becoming more difficult to solve using traditional systems, processes, structures, and other management tools.